the idea of splitting matter and of creating other particles, you're getting into a lot of alchemical realms, scientists as God territory that people, I think, naturally are concerned about. I was originally a nuclear physics major in college. Our current nuclear has a huge waste stream, and I was appalled by it. Yuri Gat of Oak Ridge taught me about molten salt reactors, and that reignited my passion in nuclear because, to me, it solves the waste problem. All you need is about 800 kilos of thorium feed per year, you know, per gigawatt of electricity. Out of that, you get 799 point something kilos of fission products. Well, the missing mass turned into energy. E equals mc squared, it turned into energy. 800 kilograms of thorium, you have 799. Uh, point something of fission products of fission products you have some fissile nuclei that means this is a nucleus that if you hit it with a neutron the nucleus begins to distend and a piece comes off and the smaller piece is about 30 or 40 percent the original mass of the nucleus and the larger fission product is basically what was left over and so what this leads to a, a double humped distribution in the masses of the fission products on this table you see the smaller fission product highlighted in yellow and then the heavier fission product highlighted in green. And then there's this gap for a while where there are things that simply are not made by fission. Uh, tungsten, gold, mercury, none of those are made by fission. And then when you get to thallium, now you're getting to what's called the decay products. These are not formed by fission. They're formed when you leave uranium and thorium and plutonium alone for you know, hundreds or thousands of years, they will decay into these products. And those are shown in this chart in uh, a pink color. And then there is what's called the transuranics. That's what happens when the uranium absorbs the neutron and doesn't fission. It turns into plutonium and americium and curium and a few others. Most of it's plutonium. I mean, the overwhelming majority of transuranics are plutonium. You get a lot of different things from fission, but you don't get everything, and that's significant. It's not as if you're dumping the whole periodic table out when you, when you make fission. You get certain elements in, in a preponderance, and you get some very rarely, and you get some not at all, for instance. You can't make gold from fission. When we first load nuclear fuel in a uranium-fueled reactor, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-238. As it burns down, first at a year, two years, and then three years, you see the formation of other things. These are the fission products, as well as some of the transuranics. The hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that most of the rod is still uranium-238. The overwhelming majority is still this unburned uranium-238. Still most of that potential energy remains to be exploited. In fact, the only fraction that has been truly burned is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. Those are the fission products. But the remainder of the material is unrealized energy. Xenon is the most common of the fission products. Some of these fission products have a really, really big propensity to eat neutrons. They call it a cross-section. It's a term that we use to describe how probable is a, is a reaction going to be. And here is xenon-135, it's cross-section relative to two nuclear fuels. Okay, see these little bitty guys? So imagine we're playing darts or something and throwing them. Which one are we going to hit here? I mean, we're going to hit the big red dot. When xenon-135 forms from fission, it really wants to eat your neutron. You split an atom, you got smaller atoms. That can poison the fuel itself and kill fission, unless the poisons can come out of the fuel. This turns out to be a big problem for real nuclear reactors. This was one of the first reactors that was ever built. This was the Hanford reactor. They turned it on and everything seemed to be going. And then after about a day or two of running it, all of a sudden the power went and dropped, like almost to zero. And they left it alone, and after about you know, 12, 18 hours, all of a sudden it went and it came back up to power again, and it held there. And they're like, what? And then pretty soon it goes, Pew, and it drops off again. They're going, this makes no sense. We're not doing anything. The thing's like turning on, and it's turning off, and it's turning on, and it's turning off. Well, what was going on was the reactor would turn on, and xenon-135 would begin to build up. And as it built up, it would start eating all those neutrons, right? And then it would, pew, and it would take the reactor back down again. And then after a while, it would decay away. And once it decayed away, the reactor would come back on again. So it was following this up and down effect. Just crazy. I mean, these guys didn't even know what xenon-135 was because this was like one of the first nuclear reactors ever built. 
This actually was a contributing effect to the Chernobyl disaster, was the presence of, of Xenon-135. I have a friend I've, I've made online who is a nuclear reactor operator, and he goes, I'm always fighting Xenon in my reactor. That's like all we do as operators is try to deal with this stuff. And it's really hard to deal with in solid fuel reactors. Uh, gases have a really hard time escaping from solids when you're trying to go in between the atoms. <laughs> my name is Dr. Stephen Boyd. I am a solid state chemist. So all of a sudden there's, there is an atom of xenon gas where there wasn't one. What did that just do to the surrounding atoms? It pushed them on a mesoscopic level. It cracks the crystals. The solid fuel will begin to swell and crack. Having that trapped and having that the most abundant uh, uh, fission product in there is, is kind of disastrous. And you begin to get this central void. This is actually a, a gap in the fuel. So now you have a structural integrity problem. It's starting to break down. In my opinion, that's not a good design. Xenon is a gas. What happens to gases in a liquid? They come right out of solution. We need to build nuclear reactors that are based on liquid fuel because liquid fuel is going to be a whole lot better at doing a bunch of things. What is easier? Running a liquid past a solid in order to transfer the heat or having the, the, the fuel be a liquid and use that in and of itself. So I would argue that, that actually combining the two is easier Sure, it's more chemistry, but so what? I'm a chemist. <laughs> there are lots and lots of chemists, and a lot of them are a hell of a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so, like, go solve the problem. There's a lot of good going to having fission in a solution. It's so controllable. Fission, solid form, sucks. Solids are a bitch. They're a pain to dissolve in acids. These fluorides flow at moderately low temperatures, and. They are just a piece of cake to process compared to solid oxides. There's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. There is always a cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done. Always. There's no such thing as a waste-free energy source. So, but with that waste, think carefully about that waste. NASA uses xenon to throw out the backside of an ion engine. There's a spacecraft in the asteroid belt now called Dawn, which is using xenon ion engines uh, to propel itself extremely efficiently. We used to joke at NASA that xenon was one of the few things worth launching into space because it actually cost about as much as it cost to put up in space. One man's waste is another man's treasure. If you come up with clever ways of utilizing that waste, you can help a lot of people and you can monetize that waste. And you can do it safely, and you can do it, in some cases, for very strategic reasons. Molybdenum is another common fission product. Uh, molybdenum-99 will decay to technetium-99, and technetium-99, in turn, is used in a variety of different diagnostic procedures. How is your heart performing? Also your bones, uh, liver, your lungs. It's, it's really a remarkable diagnostic tool. Our power reactors today, they make lots and lots of molybdenum, but it's not extractable. If you want to get it out, you'd have to shut the reactor down, depressurize it, cool it, extract the fuel, reprocess it. By the time you did that, the molybdenum's all gone. It's only got a 66-hour half-life, so you can't do it fast enough. Bismuth-213 could be connected to an antibody. These antibodies can be tailored to go and hunt down specific cells, in this case, cancer cells. Now that bismuth only has a half-life of 45 minutes, so it's very radioactive and it's going away quickly. But in that time, that antibody can go and find a cancer cell, it's got this bismuth connected, the bismuth decays, an alpha particle goes through the cell and it kills the cancer cell. I, I, I sometimes even lay in bed thinking, you know, if my kid had uh, leukemia, how hard would I be working on getting this therapy ready? for them. The radiation techniques we use in cancer therapy today, they're all based on beta emitting isotopes, not on alpha emitting isotopes. Betas, they have a big kill radius, they're not very directable. We, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's really not a smart bomb. You look at this and you think, there's got to be a good alpha emitter. Well, turns out there's not. Um, bismuth-213, which is the favored one, exists on a decay chain that no longer exists in nature, the Neptunium decay chain. It's hard to get the right kind, the right chemical one that will lock onto the right thing that's close enough to being stable that even after it decays, it doesn't just decay 10 more times in the body. 
Bismuth 213 is one decay away from being done. And that's what you want. You want one that's just about, to, that's on its very last decay. We, in the course of pursuing a thorium powered world, recreated this decay chain about 50 years ago. People have known about it for a long time. Look at the time on this report, March 2001. Mm -hmm. Actinium and bismuth-213 are currently extracted from purified thorium-229. The only practical way is to get this from the natural decay of thorium-229. It's very potent. We only need on the order of a billionth of a gram to treat a patient. And it's especially good against dispersed cancers like leukemia, cancer of the blood. Not tumorous cancers where there's a big hard lump, stuff that's hard to get to, pancreatic cancer. You get pancreatic cancer, you're probably looking at a death sentence. We can do both at the same time. We can make electrical power and we can make this useful uh, medical isotope. We need to get this stuff in the hands of doctors to treat deadly diseases like acute myeloid leukemia and other cancers. If we had this material, I really think it would lead to a revolution in fighting cancer. In reactors today, there's basically two categories of the waste. There's the fission product waste and then there's the transuranic waste. That's what happens when the uranium absorbs the neutron and doesn't fission it. The plutonium, the americium, the curium. By using the thorium cycle and using it efficiently, we can eliminate that category, the production of transuranics. We can just about eliminate that, so we're not making that in the first place. We are still making the fission products, and a number of those I mentioned can be extracted usefully. By extracting the first four fission products, xenon, neodymium, zirconium, and molybdenum, right away you've reduced the waste stream considerably. What about the rest? The two troublemakers are strontium and cesium. Strontium 90 has a half-life of 30 years. Cesium 137 has a half-life of 30 years. But even those two could have very useful applications. Strontium 90 could be fabricated into little heating modules. Cesium 137 could be used to irradiate food. Food irradiation does not cause the food to become radioactive. That doesn't happen. But by irradiating strawberries or lettuce or other leafy vegetables, uh, you can kill E. coli, and E. coli does kill people. In fact, kills a lot of people each year. Think of your home. Think of your pantry. Now imagine taking everything out of your pantry and pouring it on the floor. So your sugar and your cornflakes and your flour and your baked beans and, you know, everything is in a big pile on the floor. How valuable is that giant mix to you? It's not valuable at all. It's worthless. It's completely worthless. Well, all you do is you'd shovel it up and you throw it in the trash. Now, you've had the same stuff you had a minute ago, but now it's all been mixed together. What makes the stuff in your pantry valuable is the fact that it is separated. The sugar's in one container and the flour's in another and your cornflakes are in another altogether. So what we've got with nuclear waste is we've got that pile of everything mixed together. If we could partition it, if we could put it back in its separate categories, we would find that almost every one of those things is useful if isolated and separated from everything else. And with about 30 different elements in the fission product distribution, not every one of those will be worth extracting, but if you applied this to 10, you would probably find you had some very, very valuable materials coming out of that. Right now, all mixed together, worthless. Worthless and dangerous. But partitioned, they could be very, very valuable. The rods generate energy by transforming some of the uranium into different elements. Over time, fission products start to build up. We need chemistry to separate them out. But since the fission products are thoroughly mixed with the uranium, pyroprocessing, a nifty technology invented by argon scientists. The thing is, they call it pyroprocessing, but it's a molten salt process. They're dissolving this thing in a molten salt, and they're doing electrochemistry on it. After chopping the fuel rods into small pieces, you submerge them in a vat of molten salts. When you run an electric current through the vat, the uranium and transuranics separate out and forms crystals on the electrodes. Molten salt can not only be a fuel, it's a way to reprocess or process nuclear fuels and clean them up for reuse. I've looked carefully at so-called pyroprocessing. There are obvious improvements that can be made um, with respect to the actual pyroprocessing techniques. We can do this in a much more streamlined fashion. The dirty metals and the dirty metal oxides that have been spent, if they were fluorinated with some really safe fluorinating agents, they could be turned into liquid fluorides and separated far easier. And then the other side of the coin is, if you're going to use thorium as your, as your base load fuel, so to speak, you have to have a kickstart. The uranium-235 that's still left over, the uh, plutonium-239. But hey, that not that a great way to, to get rid of these materials? Because we've got all this waste here in the United States, we've got 70,000 metric tons of this waste. 
This is terrible. And for me as an entrepreneur and a scientist, I know that I can save lives by using those isotopes. I know that I can make money and better society with those isotopes. Take some of the waste that's already been created in our uranium fueled reactors and potentially destroy those long-lived transuranics through fission. You know, waiting them out to decay is a very slow process. Plutonium-239, for instance, has a 24,000 year half-life. So that's a long time you're gonna be waiting for that to decay. On the other hand, you can fission it, and then those fission products will decay very rapidly, and you also get an energy release and a neutron release, which is, both of which are good. You hate nuclear waste? So do I. These reactors can eat nuclear waste. The United States has no plans to recycle that val the, the valuable cladding or all that uranium that's in those uh, used uh, nuclear pellets. 70,000 tons of American nuclear waste. You're gonna need like, let's say a ton to run an experiment molten salt reactor, a ton of fissile fuel, all right? If the reactor works, we've opened the door to remediating all nuclear waste. If the reactor doesn't work, we've added one ton to a 70,000 ton pile to see if we can remediate all of it on the whole planet forever. We hate nuclear waste too, but what we really hate is we hate wasting it.